So uh, today is Sunday, June 19th, 2016. Uh, this is the fourth and final day of our four-day uh, non-residential uh, session here at Endless Path Zendo. Uh, today, I'd like to take a look at a koan that we ended yesterday's uh, 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 conversation, day show, with, uh, which was when we looked at uh, transmission case six in Demkaroku, uh, Dritaka to Michaka. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, we commented that there uh, was this beautiful, important koan in Henke Ganroku uh, that raises a similar point, or same point. So let's take a look. It's uh, Henke Ganroku 36, Changsha goes for a walk. His uh, Japanese name was Chosha. So one day Changsha went for a walk in the mountains. Uh, some translations say strolling about in the hills. When he returned to the gate of the monastery, the head monk said, Master, where have you been? Or, another translation, where has your reverence been wandering? Changsha said, I have come from strolling about in the hills. The head monk said, where did you go? First I went pursuing the fragrant grasses. Then I returned following the falling flowers. Another translation, First I went following the scented grasses, then I came back following the falling flowers. The head monk said, you are full of the spring, aren't you? Or, that is the spring mood itself. Changsha said, it even surpasses the autumn dew dripping on the lotuses. Or, another translation, it is even better than the autumn dew falling on the lotus flowers. Shui Do, Secho in Japanese, compiler of Heki Gamroku, comments, thanks for your reply. Another translation, uh, I'm grateful for that answer. So a little background, uh, who is Zhang Sha? Uh, to take a look at that, uh, we'll look at uh, Aiken Roshi's Gateless Barrier, his commentary on another koan uh, and where he refers uh, uh, a great deal, actually, to Changsha. This is Koan Case 46 in uh, Wumen Kwan. Shi Shuang stepped from the top of the pole. <clears throat> the priest Shi Shuang said, How do you step from the top of a hundred foot pole? Another mass, eminent master of former times said, You who sit on the top of a hundred foot pole. Although you have entered the way, it is not yet genuine. Take a step from the top of the pole, and worlds of the ten directions are your total body. So I won't look at the, uh, at this point, comment or verse of Wumen's, but um, here's Aitken Roshi's commentary. Shi Shuang is the name of a Linji monastery in South China, and a succession of teachers took its name. This one is probably Shi Shuang Chu, Chu Yuan, uh, Seki so, so on, who lived in the 11th century. Uh, the present case is an example of how koans develop. Shi Shuang revived an old case from Zen literature involving Changsha and his friends. Changsha is our man for this. Later, Wu Men included it in the Gateless Barrier. Now, 765 years after Wu Men, 865 years after Shi Shuang, and, and 1,090 years after Changsha. The case is a, as a koan is still vital. Show me how you step from the top of a hundred foot pole. No history is involved, yet history and biography are nonetheless instructive. Changsha and the monk Hui trained together under Nanchuan. In due time, these two brother monks became independent. Changsha became abbot of a large training center. Hui went to live in a hermitage in the mountains. How is Brother Hui getting along these days, Changsha wondered. He sent a monk to call on him with instructions about what to say. The monk arrived and asked Hui, what about when you had not yet met Nanchuan? Hui sat quietly. The monk asked, 
What about after you met Nantron? Hui said, nothing special. The monk returned to Changsha and told him what had happened. Changsha said, you who sit on the top of a hundred foot pole, although you have entered the way, it is not yet genuine. Take a step from the top of the pole and worlds of the ten directions are your total body. This story is given in full in the Book of Serenity, but it seems that Shishuang thought this portion would be enough for the purposes of his students. We was in the condition of nothing special. He had entered the way. He had realized equality and emptiness where nothing happens. There are no sages and ordinary people. There are no animals, trees, deserts, or mountains. There is no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. Saving others is out of the question. So Changsha said, it is not yet genuine. Shakyamuni, under the Bodhi tree, was not yet genuine. He was sitting there, enjoying his realization, but meantime his former disciples were feeling abandoned in the big city. He needed to step out and give them the word. <clears throat> <clears throat> Changsha had a clear view of the void, of course, but he was a man of the world and made his home there. Once he visited Yangshan, who later went on to help establish the Kuiyang school, but was that time a young monk. During the evening they were strolling under the full moon, and Yangshan said, All people have this, but they do not use it. Changsha said, How true? Won't you please use it? Yangshan said, How would you use it? Changsha seized him by the lapels of his robe, threw him to the ground, and trampled on him. The young Shan got to his feet, dusted himself off, and said, What a tiger you are! Thereafter, Changsha Chingsen was known as Sen, the great tiger. Young Shan was not equal to Changsha's challenge. He dithered and just said, How would you use it? Changsha then showed him how to step forward as this. He makes this point again in one of his Taishos. The entire universe is in your eye. The entire universe is your total body. The entire universe is your own luminance. The entire universe is within your own luminance. In the entire universe, there is no one that is not your own self. Here, Changsha recasts the last line of his message to Brother Hui. The worlds of the ten directions are your total body becomes the entire universe is in your own eye. This one phrase sums up 39 chapters of Hua Yen metaphysics. My eye and yours are holograms. Every being is a hologram. Each leaf, each bird, each flower, each child is a chalice containing all. Realizing yourself as such a chalice, chalice is your luminance. Apart from this case and the verse from Changsha that Wu Men uses in uh, case 12, it's another. Um, the only other case involving Changsha appears in the Blue Clip record. After Mu, this is one of the most important koans. Changsha, one day, went on a stroll in the mountains. When he returned to the gate, the head monk asked, Where has your reverence been wandering? Changsha said, I have come. I was strolling about in the hills. The head monk said, Where did you go? Changsha said, first I went following the scented grasses, then I came back following the falling flowers. The head monk said, that is the spring mood itself. Changsha said, it is better than the autumn dew falling on the lotus flowers. Shuedo commented, I am grateful for that answer. When I work Sezeken Roshi on this koan with Yamada Roshi, he often t he told me that the expression about the scented grasses and falling flowers is often used during the eulogy at a monk's funeral. The implication is coming and going. You enjoyed the scented grasses and falling flowers. Thus, you lived a fulfilled life. What do you make of Changsha's saying that spring is better than the autumn dew falling on the lotus flower? 
others. This is the key to Changsha's character and to all mature human character. It relates to the way he reacted to Brother Hui's nothing special and to Yang Shang's equivocation. It's true that spring and autumn It's true that spring uh, and autumn uh, can be called the same, but that is just a kind of entry to the way. It is not yet genuine. In autumn, there is no sun warming the earth after a long winter, no grasses or flowers. Spring is the time for strolling about in the hills, leisurely going and coming with the scented grasses and falling flowers becoming one's entire body. So Shui Do comments that he is grateful to Changsha for his response. Let us all be grateful. Grateful because Changsha is our teacher of Zen in this age of grave danger to the earth and its music, art, animals, and everything else. He is urging that we move off our seats and transform our attitudes and our systems. If anything, if everything is one, as Brother Hui knew, then it is also vital that we show that fact in our conduct. Worlds of the Ten Directions are indeed my total body and yours, and we neglect this primordial truth to our peril. Wu Men comments, stepping forward, turning back, is there anything to reject as ignoble or unworthy? Stepping forward and turning back, going, and coming, we find that scented grasses are very special indeed. Strolling through them, we realize our intimacy with them. Turning back through falling flowers, we delight in the total body they create. Brother Hui is depriving himself and depriving the world dithering there atop his pole. Be that as it may, how do you step from the top of a hundred-foot pole? Sa. Let's see you try it. So Aiken Roshi's words are just so wonderful, I hesitate to say anything more. But let's take a look. Uh, in today's koan, uh, we see a fully matured Chosha. Uh, he sees the same vivid world he did when he knocked Kyosan down. Uh, but now the tiger reveals a more subtle poetic expression. Yamada Roshi, commenting on this case, says a person's character changes as her, his or her inner life matures. I'd also add we may mature as we age, though a penchant for poetic expression may always have been an aspect of Changsha's character. It now seems deeply composed. One day, Changsha went for a leisurely walk in the mountains or hills, then returned. Mountains and glades uh, meadow and glades, groves and foothills, steep inclines, precipitous descents, gentle rambles, intense climbs, tiny weeds, and vast vistas all may be met when strolling about in mountains. Perhaps you've done something like this yourself. It is also a way of presenting our life when seen from a profoundly at ease state strolling through all the highs and lows, wandering about all the hards and easies of our daily journey. On his return, he met the head monk who asked, where have you been? The Amaro Roshi says the head monk is laying a trap. So, did you go someplace? Did you have a goal, a spot to arrive, something definable and separate? Just strolling about in the hills is the answer. No, really, where did you go? insists the head monk. Surely you went someplace. Where was it? Just say. Instead, Changsha takes it further. First I went, following the scented grasses, then came back, following the falling flowers. The head monk is persistent. Aha, so you were full of the spring. Well, that's the spring mood itself. Enjoying yourself, aren't you, in the beauty of springtime? It sounds innocent and appreciative, but Chosha sees the challenge and without batting an eye, uses that challenging response to present the complete view of what he's actually been revealing all along. He caps the dialogue. It is even better 
in the autumn dew falling on the lotus flowers. The warmth and fecundity of spring with buds opening, warm breezes blowing, scented grasses and flowers with bugs, birds, rippling waters and green leaves is better than autumn when everything drops away and all is bare. In autumn, the clear dew on the lotus leaves is cool and refreshing. There's no bustling enthusiasm, no delusive conceptualization. All is clear, totally empty of thought and self-centeredness, a wonderful consummation, the time of harvest. And our teachers encourage us to get there, where there's not two-ness, not even one. Autumn or winter are metaphors for this. Everything is gone. Vast emptiness, said Bodhidharma. Nothing to be called holy. Yamada Roshi states, what could be more tranquil? Indeed, what could be better? Yunman was once asked, how is it when the trees wither and the leaves fall? He answered, body exposed in the golden breeze. But in his reply, Chosa clarifies, or Changsha clarifies our practice further. He says, okay, that's good. Now please take a step further. There's something even better. This very world of differences, of comings and goings, gains and losses, grasses and flowers, births and deaths, friendships, family, work, vows, commitments, ups and downs, is it he is right in character challenging us again to step beyond emptiness. And when we do, where do we go? The head monk upholds half a picture, half a story, an important one. But emphasizing one side, he reveals his limitation. Of course, he might be taking this position to give Changsha a chance to show his stuff. If so, they're both having fun, like two jazz musicians working a duet one rising seamlessly off the creative challenge of the other. We work hard in our practice to glimpse vast emptiness free of self-centeredness. We work hard after to own it, to settle with it as the foundation of all we do and live. Given this work and the deep relief we feel when we do touch base, we usually think that this is the point to get beyond appearances and find what is greater than the comings and going of the seasons of life. To experience vast emptiness is a great relief. Chang Sha doesn't say, no, that's not it. He doesn't say, don't aim for that. Rather, he clarifies that by itself. By, he clarifies that itself by taking one step further. He steps beyond the hundred-foot pole to show the body, that is, the ten directions. Together, he and the head monk take the occasion of his little stroll to point out the great way. Their dialogue produces a rich new music showing us what Zen is or might be if we persist. It's been there from the start. After his deep, deep awakening, the Buddha sat for three weeks wiped away, blown out by the great simplicity of perfect realization. Then he got up from under the Bodhi tree, returned to the dusty old world, where he taught all mingling with ordinary events and people. Changsha is his true disciple. As is Secho, compiler of Heki Gunroku, a Blue Cliff record, who comments, I am grateful for that answer. It is his way of saying thanks. Yamada Roshi says that Changsha's walk in the hills is a very subtle koan, not easily grasped. Yet Aiken Roshi adds it is a most important koan, absolutely fundamental. He puts it second only to Mu. How wonderful our world. How generous the ordinary realities of life. At ease admits the ups and downs. I'm drawn forward without plan by the scent of new grasses. 
Following my interest, I'm led unselfconsciously back home by petals falling, completely absorbed, not separated at all. No need for schemes. This is our life, mysterious, ungraspable, complete, just as it is with all the issues, complexities, difficulties, anxieties, and problems we know too well. Dogen says, when the self goes forward to become one with the 10,000 things, it is called delusion. When the 10,000 things step in and confirm us, it is called realization, enlightenment, or intimacy. Perhaps the head monk's silence after Changsha's words is his way of giving the nod in total accord. Yep, you got it right, old man. Or maybe he was a bit abashed by his own lack. But lest we wonder, Shui Do steps in and concludes the dialogue with some rare, straightforward praise, leaving no doubt as to what's been going on. Thank you very much for this. In Book 11 of the Odyssey, Odysseus meets the great warrior Achilles in the underworld. He praises him, saying how great his accomplishments and his lofty station, even now. But Achilles answers, better, I say, to break sod as a farmhand for some poor country man on iron rations than lord it over all the exhausted dead. I find traces of Changsha in these words, though Achilles' aim for the fame of a short yet glorious life, when all is gone, he seems to regret that choice. Closer might be the Navajo chant, beauty before me, beauty behind me, I walk in beauty. Or this haiku by Master Basho, ah, it is spring, great spring, it is now, great, great spring, ah, great. In our koan curriculum, we have case 42, Umen Kwan Manju Shri, and the young woman in Samadhi. Once Manju Shri went to a place where many Buddhas had assembled with the World Honored One. When he arrived, all the Buddhas returned to their original place. Only a young woman remained, seated in Samadhi, near the Buddha's seat. Manju Shri addressed the Buddha and asked, How can the young woman get near the Buddha's seat when I cannot? The Buddha replied to Manjushri, Awaken this young woman from her samadhi and ask her yourself. Manjushri walked around the young woman three times, snapped his fingers once, took her to the Brahma heaven and exerted all his supernatural powers, but he could not bring her out. The world honored one said, Even a hundred thousand Manjushris cannot awaken her. Down below, past 1,200 million lands, as innumerable as the sands of the Ganges, lives the bodhisattva of delusive wisdom in the early stages of practice. He will be able to bring her out of her samadhi. Instantly, the bodhisattva of delusive wisdom emerged from the earth and made bows before the world-honored one, who gave his imperial order. Delusive wisdom stepped before the young woman snapped his fingers once, and at this she came out of samadhi. Wumen comments, Manjushri is the teacher of the seven Buddhas. Why couldn't he get the young woman out of her samadhi when the bodhisattva of delusive wisdom, a beginner, could? If you can firmly grasp this point, then for you, this busy life of ignorance and discrimination will be the life of the Dragon Samadhi. Case 82, Ekigonroku, we have this. A monk said to Dairu, Dair, Dairu uh, the physical body ultimately decomposes. What is the indestructible Dharma body? Dairu Ryu said, the mountain flowers cover the hillside like brocade. The valley streams are blue as indigo. This profoundly poetic Dharma response is reminiscent of Kazan Jokin's beautiful 
an important verse from Denkoroku, Transmission 6, which we looked at yesterday. Though we find clear waters reaching to the vast blue sky in autumn, how can it compare, compare with a hazy moon on a spring night? Most people want to have it pure white, but sweep as you will. You cannot empty the mind. Compare this with Changsha's. It is even better than the autumn dew falling on the lotus flowers. It's not simply about things endlessly arising in the mind so it can never be emptied. It's not simply that spring is better than fall, activity better than quiet. No, it is even better than the autumn dew, even better than the autumn dew falling on the lotus flowers, which is already a very good thing. What is the truly fundamental point here that reveals the real ground enjoyed every day by us all? Why are we so very grateful? As we go back out into our busy lives, let's allow Changsha and Shuido, Wu Men, and Dai Ryu, in fact, all our ancestral teachers from the Buddha on, to help us find our way. In fact, let us each do our best to actively welcome them as honored companions and our most worthy guides.